Hey everyone, today I'm going to walk you through how to add custom markers to your map box map. So at the end of this video, I'm going to be giving away some freebies and tools for developing your own maps at the end of this video. So you want to stay tuned so that way you can get those. This week I was playing around with some APIs for messing with some public data from the city of Austin and I ran into a problem. A lot of the tutorials were written for Google Maps, but I have been working with a lot of Mapbox stuff lately. So it posed an issue and so as I started solving for that issue, I thought it would be really great to make a video. So this video primarily is dealing with how to add markers to a map, but at the end, I'm gonna add in some of those elements from the open data stuff that I was solving for this week so you can see the potential for custom markers. So the first thing you might be wondering is what a marker actually is or why I use the term marker. Well, within the map box world, a marker is a visual representation of a specific coordinate, point, or feature on a map. There are three basic parts of a marker, the data, the icon, and the display. Data is what positions your marker in the world in space on a map. It also is the information behind it. So when you click on it, it says what exists at that point. The marker itself is what you visually see when you click on it, but it's the physical, for lack of a better term, object. It is the visual representation. It can be a circle. It can be a person crossing a street. It can be a boat. It can be a tree but visually that has to exist somewhere. Now there are certain parts of Mapbox that can automatically from a system side and an API side just give you a give you a default map marker. We've all seen the Google Maps red pin. That's just a default. But within Mapbox you have tons of customizability options for things like markers. And the last part of a marker is the display. It's how your data makes it from code in your files to actually being displayed on a map. Within that framework, how does it fit? How is it displayed? What are you optimizing it for? Some markers sit on top of the base map and some markers are actually part of the base map. Think of things like city names and labels. Those are technically advanced markers, but they sit within your base map. But if you were trying to do something more interactive, say with a client side address entering and p dropping a pin, that would be something that would exist on top of the base map. So these three things are things you need to consider when building custom markers within your map. There's a list you can actually read on Mapbox in their documentation that explains how you might decide which best use case is for you. So now that you know what we're going to be doing, I'm gonna walk you through the code that I used to make a very simple application to drop a custom. I'm gonna walk you through each line and kind of show you what my thought process was, but also show you some of the areas that I got stuck so that hopefully you don't get stuck. So we've all seen this portion before up here. This is gonna be your header. This is where you're going to add in your scripts. So for instance, you see like in the last video, if you're unfamiliar with how to get a map set up on a website, you'll wanna check out my last video. But today's video, we already have these two map box scripts put in our script tags up here. We've also added in this other one up here. This is a little bit of CSS to help style our maps so they look a little bit nicer. And right here, if you look on line 12, we have the super secret Ajax magic. And basically what this is, it is a JavaScript library that allows us to query data from different sources. It's kind of a widely used way of storing data, but also a widely used way of obtaining data by doing what's known as a query. And we're gonna run one later. It's a little bit more advanced, but if you hang on, you're gonna understand what we're doing and it can help you make some really neat customized maps. So, as you may have seen in the first video, we're just gonna go ahead and create an area. This time, I'm not gonna be putting the map on a web page with other elements. It's just gonna be a full screen web app so you can actually see what's going on in everything. So the first part we're gonna be working right here is with getting our map set up. So this is basically where you're going to add in your custom token. This one's mine, it's publicly available. You can find it if you want. Get your own, this makes it a whole lot easier to work with and keep track of your apps and how people are using them. Right here, we have our map. We're setting up our container, adding a style here. We're gonna fix our center of our map on Texas because Texas is the best state ever. And we're gonna give it a zoom of nine, which is just to zoom in on our location area. When I run the app, you'll see what this does. 
While doing research for this video, this is one of the resources that I found for open data. And what I found is that they actually make their data available through a service called Soda. And if you don't know what that is, I have a link to a blog post I did a few weeks back about understanding what Soda is and why it's important and why maybe you should implement it into a few of your apps. But what we're doing here is we're basically setting up a query on this data, we're just getting the data, we're not trying to add to it, and then what we're also doing is we're including a limit. Now this is just for the sake of working within this app. I don't want to query all the pet data, I just want to do two so I can just have a basic idea that I'm getting a good call and I'm getting a good return on some of this data. This isn't how you would normally run a call like this. Normally you would want to put some type of a buffer. You don't want to be querying every single piece of data because it's going to make your app run really, really slow. Um, additionally here, here's another token. Of course you're going to need to get your own. This one just exists here in the code. And then what we've gone and done is we've then created two variables from this function. So there's a function right here that if it runs successfully and we get what we're looking for, it then pushes these two right here. And so what I've done is I've essentially created these tags within this soda call. You normally wouldn't hard code something like this. We normally would run a for loop in order to actually parse through all of the returns. But for this example, I'm just parsing through the very first one. We're gonna go ahead and give me the map data, the one at position one, give me the location, give me the latitude for a lap, and give me the map data, position one or zero, location, longitude. So now I have two variables that are the lat and the long. So easy part, we're gonna print those to the console, we can see those later. The next part is actually using a long lap property, which is a GeoJSON property that Mapbox uses specifically to format its latitudes and longitudes. Now this is the part that actually took me a whole lot of time and I'm ashamed to say it took me like a couple days trying to figure out, well, how am I not doing this right? What's not working? I read the documentation and figured it out in like 15 minutes. So I'm saving you the time that it took me like two days to figure out, which maybe not the best thing to admit, but it's also a use case for reading the documentation. So always read the documentation, always read the documentation. So now we're setting up this property here. We have a little constant that we're setting up. Then we're calling it from this right here, we're setting it to our variables, latitude and longitude, and now we're printing it right here just because we want to be able to see. Let's see what we got. This is where we actually begin adding markers to the map. So up here, we've created an empty map, nothing on it, just a base map. Here, we've gathered some data, and now we're creating the actual display to the map itself. So what we've gone and done here is this is just a static marker. This is a default added to a specific latitude and longitude, longitude and latitude within this map that we've created. But then this one right here, we're actually filling it from the pet data that we queried from up here. So now what we're doing is we're saying, give me the pet data from this source, parse it through this, create latitude and longitude variables, add that latitude and longitude variable to the long lap property from Mapbox, the GeoJSON that we talked about, and then we're going to then take it and get us a new constant called pet marker, which exists at this query longitude and latitude. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like now. So if you look right here, this is our just default hard-coded point, but if you come over here to the great city of Austin, you can actually see that this latitude and longitude that we printed earlier is actually now part of our latitude and longitude property and is now bringing the data from that publicly available data that just exists statically into a real-time application that's here. The potential for this is great because if you have a for loop, you can then loop it over, say, the, the last 10 entries and populate a map based on a for loop. It's a really powerful, really easy to use tool. And if you're not using it, you should really consider ways to avoid hard coding within your mapping applications. A lot of the tutorials that I've seen on Mapbox and as examples have hard coded points which may, is not the best use case for data that's publicly available or large data sets or data that you want constantly changing. And it's really as simple as that. 
One of the big things that I learned this week is that using open data, you really do have to dig into the documentation, not only on the data itself, how it's formatted, but also on the side of how you're going to interpret that and use that within your application. So if you're more interested in the Ajax portion of this in the data query side, I'm gonna be creating another video where I'm actually gonna walk through that for loop. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that pet data, we're gonna bring in the data set, say from the past 10 or do a date range, we're gonna pull that data in and then in the next video, we're actually going to run some analysis on that just so we can start experimenting with what we can do within a web application. I'm thinking a dog, but cats seem more mischievous, or we could just do something like in the middle, like a ball, just like a roundness. I don't know, what, what other symbols are there for pets? Like cat, dog, a fish, a turtle. If nobody says anything, I'm using a turtle. That's what I'm gonna do. And once again, thank you for watching. If you want to get the latest news and updates from me and my blog, you should subscribe to it over at Maptical. I put a link in the description down below so you can go and put in your email. Um, you'll get the latest newsletter which goes out every week, usually on a Saturday morning or a Friday night, and it just has a digest of interesting GIS news, mapping related news, programming, dev related news, and a little bit of Notion hacking because I really like Notion and I'm not gonna stop talking about it. If you want, follow me on Instagram. There will be a link in the description, so that way you can come and be a part of the video making process. You can see some of the ideas and the inspiration that don't quite make it into these YouTube videos. They usually end up on Reels over on Instagram, so you'll definitely want to check that out. Lots of quick tips, lots of really interesting data and information that doesn't always make it into these long form videos. And so once again, thank you for watching. If you haven't yet, remember to like and subscribe this video, and also let me know what other topics that you're interested in me covering. I have a pretty good library of topics that I like to cover, but I'd also like to address questions that I see you guys asking. So don't be afraid to let me know what you'd like me to cover, and I'll be glad to look into it. Thanks for watching.